Hi, I'm Tom Savini, and you're watching Without Your Head. But why? Welcome to the station of decapitation without your head. I'm Nasty Neal. I'm Petrus Trista. And we're joined the, the return of Caroline Williams to the show. First time on video. Yeah. Bring it to me back. So 10 minutes to midnight comes out January 19th on video on demand. Uh, for people not aware yet, could you give them an idea of what the movie's about? It is not just a vampire film. It isn't. Uh, and this is not just a horror film. It's got its share of scares and gore, but it really is a very emotional journey of one woman's um, trip into the past a little bit. Uh, her death um, becomes sort of a new life in a way. Um, there's some Me Too stuff in it and that's addressed it's not the absolute foundation of the story as a matter of fact that angle on the story takes a very unique and interesting turn that i don't think people expect um it's a bit of a roller coaster ride this film it's incredibly well scripted and eric directs everything like an absolute champ we had a real ensemble cast in this film there's not a character in this film that's a throwaway character. Oh, he's there to be killed. Right. There, these characters have depth and development and lives. And in the way they interact with Amy, um, that story is, is extremely full. There's a lot to keep up with in this film. Mm -hmm. When you said that the Me Too stuff isn't, it's there, but it's not necessarily like a main part of the, the story. I always think that's uh, the most effective way to use social commentary in a film otherwise it kind of becomes like you're trying to teach somebody something but if it's there and you, you notice that it, it's cool and if not you know it doesn't deflect from the agree movie. nobody wants to sit in a movie theater and have somebody shaking their finger at them um and what's interesting about that particular angle is you get to go back in time and see how that relationship started and it's unexpected and it's unique mm -hmm. and you know the story is inevitably the story moves along at such a fast pace um each scene segues into the next scene and like i said you're you're just you're you're along for this incredible ride and you get to explore this woman's life in conjunction with all the other lives that exist within that radio station it's well, a very interesting take I mentioned radio station. I'll say, was that fun to play a DJ again? It's such a cocooned environment. There's so much comfort there. And the difference is that Stretch's radio station was very rustic. And, you know, she's sort of a cowgirl at the mic. Uh, Amy's in a top of the line studio where she has lived her entire emotional life. You know, she's not young anymore. She's young at heart, but she's not young anymore. And the beginning of the end of her career is, is being set in motion. And she doesn't know it at the time. And you get to see that slow dawning as the story carries out. She gets to, she gets to have a visit with her own conscience at one point in one of the more emotionally affecting scenes in the movie. And the hallmark of that scene, as far as I'm concerned, is the performance of Alice Kremlberg from Orange is the New Black. Um, she plays the younger version of Amy, and she's going to Amy to find, to get advice and to get guidance. And it's a unique female relationship within that work-oriented life that you don't see at the beginning of the film. So the, the stories of these women they're almost contradictions in time. Um, and it's very emotionally affecting. I, I've heard from people who have said, my God, when Amy is giving her younger self advice through the prism of a life lived, what would you say to your younger self? In this movie, you get to find out. Mm -hmm. Um, is that something that interested you in the uh, in the movie itself? Is uh, you yourself a veteran uh, actor who stays relevant and uh, you know does tons of films still today? And this is a similar character but a different you know, line of work. 
you know, I've, I've started living a new life of my own over the last few, few years. Um, my children are grown. I moved into a place of my own. I started a new film at the very same time called Green Light, directed by Graham Denman. Excellent film. Um, I understand what it's like to reboot and start over. And I changed my look. Uh, you know, I, I know what that's like. And it was when I picked up the script and began reading it, uh, Eric and Carson were so locked in to that psychology. And um, it resonated so strongly with me. And it, 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 I, I get the change. The opportunity was there to be able to live many lives within one movie. And that's utterly unique. I haven't had that chance. I haven't done that in films so far. Mm -hmm. Usually you're playing a singular character at a moment in time. Not this one. Uh, Tris, do you have a question? Yeah, I do. I'd also like to comment that, um, you know, I, I, I'm very struck by your sincerity as a person. I think that comes across in your work. Um, but I'm wondering, you play a DJ in the film, and I'm wondering uh, what kind of music uh, you, inspires you or you've been listening to lately. I listen to so many varieties of music. Um, you know, I'm a rock chick originally, um, but I came of age as a kid with the Beatles and Paul Revere and the Raiders and the Rolling Stones and really classic bands from back then. My whole life has been a musical exploration. So many people have brought me so many wonderful uh, samples of music that I've been able to embrace, you know, premier among them, Jeremy Saffer, the brilliant uh, rock metal photographer who's turned me on to so many black metal, death metal uh, bands, Wednesday 13 and uh, 69 Eyes, uh, Black Veil Bride, um, um, Motionless and White, which is a remarkable band, Barrier Dead, um, you know, so many. Uh, Zeal and Ardor, which is a new band that I've recently um, embraced and enjoyed. Um, and so many musicians that I've become acquainted with over time whose music inspires me and their musical explorations inspire me. Culture is always moving forward. It does not really go backwards. And um, it was wonderful to be able to bring a lot of the music that I love and we love, and here's Eric, uh, hey guys. to this film because you really get to experience some very, very cool music. Um, I like trying a little bit of everything. Country music, rock, pop. I still listen to Kiss FM here in LA, which is like top 40. Um, but I love my metal bands. I love Devil Driver. Um, I love Rob Zombie. I love Marilyn Manson. Um, those are real mainstays of my repertoire. Those are the things I shuffle with Alexa. <laughs> <laughs> well, so we also have a writer. Eric, hi. hi, guys. I'm sorry. Hello. Whoa. So happy to have him here. Me too. So when you were writing uh, the movie, did you have Caroline and Roll uh, in mind for the role? Caroline was the most delightful surprise of this whole process. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think I think poetically it, it was a great written. story. Yeah, poetically it was. I think it was written for her. We just didn't know it. Um, it, it was originally answered Barbara Crampton through Nick Tucci, um, the late great Nick Tucci, who um, passed it on to her. They did your next together, and she unfortunately had to pass because of scheduling issues. Blah blah blah. blah. But she was very kind and opened her Rolodex, and Caroline Williams was in it, and the script was passed on. And Caroline read it and called me within like two minutes of looking at it and said, "I'm in." And I was like, oh, "Okay." And then by the end of the day, we were signed, and we were figuring out flights. Um, and I think that it was just. The most enormous gift. Um, Barbara was very generous, and the fact that it just—it was a direct line to Caroline. I mean, I think that there's so much poignancy and poeticism um, that the movie has because, precisely because it's Caroline. Um, and I, 
am excited. I'm so happy people are seeing that. I mean, I know we talked about it on set, Caroline, but the fact that people are getting it is just the most gratifying thing right now. It's been so, it's been such an embrace. We've had such an embrace. And as I've said, we were a really wonderful ensemble cast and uh, there are no throwaway roles in this film. Uh, every character is so fully developed and every character brings so much to the progression of the storyline. Um, it was an amazing experience to work with Nicole Kang, William Yeomans, Adam Wepler, Nicholas Tucci. Um, and I think audiences, as they see the film, they're really embracing uh, that. Uh, speaking of that, like, um, since we live in a weird time right now with COVID, uh, did that change at all how the movie was going to be released? You know, we had this plan that we were going to roll out at a bunch of in-person September, October festivals, right? And a lot of these get pushed or canceled. Eric's or idea. Yeah, and they, and, they go, and, they go, and they go way, way down and they got really small and selections were smaller. So we saw that happen. I mean, we thought in the spring we were gonna have a shot and then obviously we, we didn't. So we said, this, we want this movie to be launched with audiences. We want this movie to have some kind of festival experience. And so we sort of did this hybrid theatrical festival release at the same time. So we ended up self booking like 50 cities. We were in a few chains, the Harkins chain uh, out West and uh, over here on the East coast, Cinema World and a few other places. And so we were, we did like, three weeks to a month in with, with movie theaters and some special pop-up outdoor screenings. Caroline was in Connecticut for a month doing this really awesome press tour and going to different screenings and in, in, throughout the Northeast and socially distanced outdoor Halloween festivals, blow up screens, um, right. which I think was just so in line with the movie that like, even though the shit was hitting the fan, we decided to get rebellious and just do keep it safe, but but make sure we did it because the idea of this movie being birthed without that just didn't make sense to me. And we were really lucky to have a really badass world premiere at Popcorn Frights at um in Fort Lauderdale. They launched it in August at their special pop-up drive-in horror show. They'd been showing a lot of Shutter movies, um, and we were their grand finale movie, which was just oh, nice. super cool and it was sold out. And that just catapulted us into this really cool. September, October, and we got to see it with audiences. We got to hear screams and groans and cringes. And Caroline got to meet with the fans and do we did Halloween trails and signings. And it was just like it was the best, wasn't it, Caroline? It was awesome. It was it was so extraordinary. And the thing is, we got to go to a lot of open societies that were still having interior screenings. First time I ever saw the film was at Cinema World in Providence, Rhode Island. That's the side, yep. Yeah. Yes. And you. we were in inside a theater. There were only eight people there, but I didn't care. Mm -hmm. um, full cinema sound and screen. And we got, I got to see the movie for the first time with Eric, the way it should be seen, ideally. And, um, you know, I, I get to do it again. I'm hoping that we're going to do it in Texas in February at Cult Classic Convention. February 19 through 21. Um, we're going to see if we can get a theater. Mm -hmm. They're very open. Masks desired, but not required. And uh, we had an interior screening in Greenville, Texas at the, at the uh, Texan Theater, which is an extraordinary experience. Um, and I hope to do it again. I hope to do it again when I'm there. Cool. Uh, Trista, you have a last question? Yeah, I was wondering where you guys shot. I wasn't able to determine it from uh, watching the film. We shot in a in an active radio station in Willimantic, Connecticut. Um, this small town radio station that I that I interviewed at for years and actually did a short uh, a decade before, um, but it was operational. And so we would roll in at like 530 at night as they were leaving and we would roll out at 530 in the morning as they were getting there, have breakfast, go back to the hotel and fall asleep at eight in the morning to do it all again. And we did it in seven crazy overnights. It was fast. It went fast. Yeah. So video on demand, January 19th. And for all the other things you mentioned, you know, some of the festivals and outdoor places, where could people follow 10 to midnight to see like uh, where they can find it? Uh, you can follow at mainframe pictures on Instagram, Caroline's on Instagram at, at, at Willie Caroline 86 Caroline or just at Willie Caroline. Which one is it? At Willie Caroline, W-I-L-L-I-C-A-R-O-L-I-N-E. <laughs> we both, uh, we both post uh, all the things. So you'll be able to, to check it all out. Very cool. Perfect. All right. Well, thanks for both of you guys being on. Thank, Thank you. you. Sorry, I was Happy late. But I guess okay. Bye, guys. Bye. Have a good Bye. day.
Hi, I'm Jim Ojula, writer, director, creature, creator of the eco horror film Strange Nature, and you are watching without your head.